Guys, as I've said so many times, we don't come sit here on a Sunday morning because it's some kind of a tradition, and this is what people do. If that was the fact, I promise you I won't be here. I really, I, I can guarantee you that. Because I hate fate, and I hate, I hate counterfeit, and I hate plastic, and I hate false people. That's why one of my favorite sayings is keep it real. But anyway, listen, before I get too hectic here, it's just it's a quite a way to like, <laughs> intro that. Um, I just want to thank all the guys that are working so hard and painting and cleaning up and whoever's doing what, and thank you so much. We appreciate it and uh, yeah, that's good, good stuff. The title of my message this morning is Voices. I was in Durban last Sunday morning at this time. I took some puppies down there to go and deliver and I was along the beachfront and what I saw really grieved me. I saw hunger addicts, sugars addicts, alcoholics, destitute, homeless people taken over the Golden Mile that was once upon a time this fantastic place. I saw the inner city crumbling and uh, it's just so sad to see people with no hope. And very often we get to a place of hopelessness because we listen to the wrong voices. <coughs> Besides the fact that the economy is tough and all this kind of stuff, you know. Are you people awake? <laughs> For those of you who believe it, say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I, am what it says I, am. I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. God said it. God said it. I believe it. I believe it. He said that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. He said that greater is he that is in me. Than he that's in the world. I'm made in his image and likeness. He is restoring the years the locust is eaten. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me, I will condemn. Every tongue that rises up against me, I will condemn. This is my heritage. This is my heritage. As a child of the Lord. As a child of the Lord. This word is forever settled in heaven. This word is forever settled. It can never change. It can never change. Ever. Ever. He said it. He said it. I believe it. I believe it. That settled it. Amen. Amen. So we're talking about voices this morning. I haven't come here to play games. If I wanted to play games, I'd have become a kindergarten pastor and uh, gone that route. But I've come here because I came out of a, my life was a mess, and God just pulled me out of my mess somehow miraculously. And yeah, it wasn't easy getting out. And it wasn't easy getting out the hole I was in. I was in a hole for 25 years because I was listening to wrong voices. Ever since I was a little boy, I heard a voice in my head saying, you're a useless, no good rubbish, and you'll never not do anything. And I heard all these different voices. You know, and we hear voices every single day. And some of the voices are audible. Some of the voices are silent. Some voices, you know, when a husband uh, or a wife looks at her husband, she's got to look. It's a voice. You better listen. Otherwise, there's going to be, oh, I can't even take the look. <laughs> Otherwise, there's going to be a consequence. A picture. There's a picture there of a, a fish eagle diving down. It's telling me something. Art gives it. It's, it's, it speaks. It's got a voice. You know? Some voices are quiet and some voices come in the, in the form of thoughts. You know, I've met many people and take a lot of drugs and stuff in my time and got caught, all caught up in uh, drug and use psychosis and, you know, just acting crazy and met a lot of crazy people. And I met a lot of people who said they had voices in their heads. But we've all got voices in our heads. They just brought it across as audible voices. Thoughts are silent voices that speak into our heads. Some voices come in written words, like the word of, uh, of God or a newspaper or something. Some come through art, some via different various forms of media, music, um, or through an action. But however voices come, we will make a choice based on the voices that we entertain between our ears. However they come. Maybe you grew up tough. Maybe you grew up with our parents. Maybe you're an orphan, maybe you come from a divorced family. I'm sorry, I can't change that. 
I really can't change that. I myself as a product with quite a dysfunctional background, but this I can't change that. Man. But I'm not going to walk like a victim forever because of what happened to me there. Okay. I've got to rise up and get over it. Otherwise, I'm going to live a very mundane, under par life. You know? And uh, I just want to share a little bit with you uh, two stories out of the Bible. Two scenarios about, you can go, uh, open your Bible so long to Numbers 13. It's right in there, one of the first Genesis uh, uh, Deuteronomy Numbers. You'll find it around the first five, six books of the Bible. How many of us have made bad decisions because we listened to wrong voices? <coughs> How many of us? I stand first in the queue. Now, if we keep listening to wrong voices, and we make decisions made on, based on the voices we're listening to, we're going to get further and further away from our destiny and our true calling of the truth. Because every single one of you people sitting here today, is made for a plan and a purpose. There are no failures or mistakes sitting here. I don't care how you got here. There are no failures or mistakes. I don't care how you got on the planet. People will say, what if I was a rape baby? Well, then you're still on the planet. And God says in His Word, in the Psalms, He says, before you were born, I knew you. Somehow God saw the beginning from the end. You know what I mean? So even if you were a product, of a terrible scenario like that, you are still destined to be here. And God still has a purpose for you. And God is so big that He'll work all things together for good. But the thing is, you've got to start listening to His voice, people. We've got to start listening to the voice. You know these voices we listen to all the time, yeah, these things that influence us, like fashion and music and media and all this kind of stuff. That can suck you up and, 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 and deviate you from your destiny. Hello, are you awake? Amen. So now, what happened was, God chose these people. They ended up in Egypt in a state of slavery for 400 years. So they got out of there, now they're wandering around in a wilderness with this guy called Moses who was a murderer. So God chose this murderer who stuttered to lead them around, to deliver them basically. So if God can use a murderer who stutters, uh, Moses said, uh, listen, I can't talk properly, get somebody else. <laughs> So God got his brother. Isn't that ironic? And then you know what happened? His brother and his sister came against him. Because he married a chick who was uh, black. He married an Ethiopian woman. And his brother and his sister said, surely this isn't the only evidence hearing from God because they didn't like the fact that he had an interracial relationship. Hello, this is Genesis people. This is not South Africa in 2018. <laughs> Been going, you know, the, the world doesn't change that much. Anyway, so now, these people, God wants them out of the wilderness in the promised land. He wants them in a good place, a land of milk and honey. He's illustrating them. He sent his voice through the prophets and this kind of stuff. So then, if we go to uh, Numbers 13, I want to read verse 1 and 2. God sends his voice, or he speaks to Moses. And he says, send men to scout out the country of of Canaan that I'm giving to the people of Israel. Send one man from each ancestral tribe, each one a tried and true leader in the tribe. I've just chosen, I think it's a message translation here, just to make it easier reading. Okay, now I'm going to jump to verse 21. So he says, there's 12 tribes, take these 12 guys, one from each tribe, send them out into this place, let them go and check the scene out there, because this is where I want to take it. When they were on their way, they scouted around the, the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Riyal towards Lebo Hamath. Their route went through the Negev desert and to the town of Hebron, Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai. Descendants of the giant Anak lived there. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they arrived in Eshkol the valley, they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes. It took two men to carry it on a pole. So this is the scenario. This place is a nice land. They've got big bunches of grapes. One person can't manage this bunch, so they've got this pole with this massive bunch of grapes. They take it back now to Moses to tell him what this land is like. It took two men to carry it slung on a pole. They also picked pomegranates and figs. They named the place Eshkol Valley, Grape Cluster Valley, because of the huge cluster of grapes they had cut down there. After 40 days of scouting out the land, they returned home. 
So they went there for 40 days, 12 spies, checked the land out, now they come back. So now they must give their report to this guy. They presented themselves before Moses and Aaron, this is his brother, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Tadesh. They reported to the whole congregation and they showed them the fruit of the land. So they bring this massive bunch of grapes and they give them a report of what happened. You want to go and have some water or something? You okay? Maybe someone give the lady some water. Can you just some water to the... Um, so yeah, they are with this big... Uh, all the people are here now and they're giving them a report back. So they tell them that they presented... Uh, they showed them the fruit, told them the story of their trip. And they pre presented themselves before Mo Moses, Aaron, the whole congregation. Oops, I've doubled that down. And they said, we went into the land which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey. Just look at this fruit. The only thing is that the people who live there are fierce. Their cities are huge and well fortified. Worse than yet, we saw descendants of the giant Anak. They saw this very large people there. And the Amorites in the hill country and the Canaanites are established in the Mediterranean. So they went there. Basically, they're saying this is a very good place, but... You know that little word, but? But these people are very tall. These people are settled in the land. These people are very fierce. Their cities are huge and they're fortified. And uh, so on and so forth. Then Caleb, the, one of the guys that went up is called Caleb. He and he had his buddy called Joshua. Caleb uh, called for silence before Moses and he said, this is what Caleb's voice is. Their voice is, there's a lack of place there, but hey, no, you can't go there. It's no, it's no good. The, the people are too big, we're not able. <coughs> Caleb says, let's go up and take the land now. We can do it. Another translation says, let us go up at once. Has anyone else got a, a, another translation there perhaps? Let us go up immediately, Charlie. We must go up and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. We must go up and take possession because we can certainly conquer it. We can do it. But the others said, they send another voice. The other voices. So you've got two voices, Caleb and Joshua, they were the ones pro. Let's go and do what we can do. And the other voices say, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than us. Um, they spread scary rumors among the people of Israel. So now the voices the gossiping, did you hear, did you hear, they are giants there, okay, and then it says we scouted out the land from one end to the other, it's a land that swallows people up whole, the, but they've just been saying um, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, now they are swallowing people up whole, we saw these giants there, and uh, alongside them we felt like grasshoppers, and they looked down on us as if we were grasshoppers. So, here's the thing I want to share with you. There's 12 guys from one nation go and spy out the land. 10 people come back with a negative report. They send a negative voice. And the people listen to the negative voice. The other spies said, uh, Caleb says we can go and do it. The other guy says we can't do it. It's not possible. One journey with two voices. Do you know the thing about voices? Is the voice that you listen to and act on, you live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what the consequence was of this? Is that this whole nation never entered the land of milk and honey. The whole nation, they never entered. They walked around for 40 years in a wilderness because they did not believe they were able to do it. They listened to the wrong voice. It's very important to listen to the right voices. And we need to hear God's voice primarily above any other voice in the world because He's our manufacturer. He's our producer and He's our life source, people. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been. You are created in the image and likeness of God and He's got a plan and a purpose for you. And He's wired you and made you the way exactly that you are for a plan and a purpose. Yes, maybe your signals got crossed. Maybe you've taken some detours. But that doesn't change his purpose for you. Listen here, yeah, I, I don't know what this thing is, actually. This here. Yeah, it's like a type of a desk. Is it a pulpit? Whatever it is, they made it out for a person to stand and put stuff on. 
Now, whether I take it and I hit it with a hammer and scratch on it and write graffiti all over it, and uh, it still had the original purpose, no matter what it looks like, no matter what you use it for. You know, you can use it for cutting veg veggies. <laughs> and get it full of cuts and all this kind of, but that's not the original purpose, but it still stands for an original purpose. You understand? Mm -hmm. So you had a purpose. And no matter what's happened to you, it doesn't lose your original intent, your original design. You still have your original design. Forty years in the desert, no milk and honey. And these eyes are... There's grapes there, they're eating these bunches of grapes out of the river that two guys, it takes two guys to carry. One thing I can tell you that I've learned in life is that grasshoppers don't eat grapes. If you think you're a grasshopper and you don't cross over to where the grapes are, you don't eat the grapes. And everyone's looking for grapes, everyone's looking for something. Everyone's seeking something in life. Another translation says we were like mere insects in their sight. Has anyone got any other, that last verse in, in uh, Numbers 13, the very last verse? Has anyone got any other translation that says something else? We were like mere insects. What do you do with bugs? You exterminate them. Insects, grasshoppers in this house. It's very important to screen the voices. And the voices don't just come through your ear. They don't just come through your ear gate or your eye gate. They come through your mental processing unit gate. I'm trying to put it in computer jargon, but I'm not computer literate. <laughs> through your what's it dim turkey? What do you put all your information into on a computer? Oh, hard the hard drive. Okay, these drives aren't so hard. Although these are sometimes, you know, these drives are actually quite soft, but you get the picture. Mm. Let's check out another scenario. Let's go to 1 cha uh, Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. The voices you listen to will determine where you go in life. The voices you believe, the voices you act on. There is nothing that you cannot do. God said, with Him all things are possible. That means nothing is impossible. Man, imagine going through life thinking that nothing is impossible. Knowing that nothing is impossible and acting like nothing is impossible. That you can do anything. Mm, it's very quiet here. Are we at 1 Samuel 17? Let's go down to verse 20. Now, this is the scenario. Israel is at war. They've got a king called Saul. They're at war with a nation called the Philistines. So the Philistines are camped on one hill. Israel's camped on the other hill. Every morning they've got this champion, this giant called Goliath. He comes out and he says, who are you to... Uh, and, he, and, he, and he bad mouths them and they all run to their tents and they tremble. So David is a shepherd boy and his father is a sheep keeper or shepherd. And daddy sends him to take some bread and cheese to the brothers in the army. So David rose early in the morning. He left the sheep with a keeper and he took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. Jesse is his father, not Charlie's dog. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper he ran to the army and he came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men and said, What shall be done for the man who kills him, and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
so shall it be for the man done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused, aroused against David. So yes, his older brother, and this guy's got about seven or eight brothers, seven of them. And they're all in the army. He's the youngest. So he's looking after the sheep. You know the person who looks after the sheep is like the bottom of the picking order. So his older brother is upset with him and he says, Why did you come here? Why have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your naughtiness or insolence of your heart. For you've just come down to watch the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him towards another and he said the same thing. So his brother sent a voice and said, listen man, you're just a little wimp, but you've come here to now check what's going down here. He sent his voice. But David didn't listen to the voice. You see, because David used to hang out with the sheep at night and look at the stars and play his harp and write songs and talk to his God. And he was secure in who he was. He was connected to his Creator, people. You see, when you're connected to your Creator, you can hear the voice. If you're not connected, if you don't put the plug in there, that plug can lie right next to that thing. You won't draw the power if, it, if you're not connected. You won't hear the voice. You see, and the only way to get connected to God is to surrender. Is to give up. So now, uh, then he turned to and from another, and he said the same thing. And these people answered him. <coughs> the first ones that now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. So they tell the king, "Listen, there's this little guy walking around here saying that he's going to take this guy out." And Saul said to him, uh, um, obviously he called him, and David says to Saul, to the king, "Let no man's heart fail because of him." Your servant will go up and fight the Philistine. And Saul said, you are not able. You cannot beat this guy. You aren't able. You don't have the capability or the ability to go and take on this giant. You are not able. You are not able. You just came here to watch the war. He's hear these voices. So what does David do? He says, um, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a, a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came, I took the lamb out of the flock, and I went and after, after it, and I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from the mouth. So this light, he took out the lion. That is those big, hairy creatures with mane that are quite strong. And he says, he delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard, I struck it, and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Phil Philistine will be like one of them. He didn't go on what other people said. He went on his courage, his strength, and his ability. And he had his confidence from God, because he was connected to God. Hello. Is there anybody out there? And David says, the, the, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, he'll deliver me from the end of this Philistine. So Saul says, go. So the story is that David goes and he overcomes, he beats this giant with a slingshot. He doesn't even have a sword. Throws a stone, knocks him on the temple, goes and cuts the guy's head off with his own sword. He overcame a giant against all odds. And many of us in life think that there's something in front of us, some kind of a giant that we can't overcome. Whatever it may be, we all have our own little big giants, we think they're big. Something that we cannot overcome because we've listened to the wrong voices perhaps. David hears the voice of God and he's unmoved by the fear of the whole army. That whole army was lying in their tents trembling, qualified the, the guys that were that had the weapons and the know-how. There's one mighty man that was in that army that slay, slew 800 people. As a matter of fact, after he killed them, they had to open his hand up off the sword. If you read this amazing book, this Bible, it tells you about all kinds of things. We've all heard many voices in our lives. 
Some have been good. Some have been bad. Some have hurt us. Some have angered us. Some have confused us. Some have lied to us. Some have humiliated us. So maybe some have uplifted us. But I want to tell you that there will always be voices in life. Because that's just what happens. Is that when you're alive from the moment, even when you're sleeping, there's voices going on in your subconscious mind, in your memory bank. The good voices, the bad voices, and the ugly voices. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And you have the power to choose what voices you believe. And I want to encourage you today because if a guy like Nick Vujicic, who has no arms and legs, can be a motivational speaker and has pushed through and overcome all the odds from being teased for years and years as a little kid, praying for God to bring back arms and legs, nothing growing, you know, and pushing through all that kind of stuff. Surely, I mean, what excuse have we got? What excuses have we really got? Joshua and Caleb and, and, and uh, David, they made right choices. Do you know that Caleb and, and Joshua went through to the Promised Land? They're the only two out of that whole bunch. Because they were the guys who wanted to go over and inherit. Caleb inherited a place called Hebron, the highlands, the highest land in the, the mountain country. And Joshua went on to conquer 31 kings in the Promised Land. Listen, there's lots of kings in the Promised Land. Lots of giants. Lots of giants. But I want to tell you something this morning that the biggest giants you've got to overcome are living inside you. They're living inside you. Your giant that you're facing is not your mother, your father, your uncle, the government. Those are just challenges. Your giants are selfishness, perhaps anger, bitterness, envy, greed, depression, rejection, unforgiveness, things that we need to overcome so that we can start functioning. The good thing is if you go in and read the book of Joshua, he went in and he conquered the 31 kings. It's a historical fact that he went in and conquered them. But he didn't listen to any voices. You've got to listen to the right voices. One of the exercises I do with my counselors is please write me an A4 page of what you think about yourself. What is your opinion of you? And they look at me puzzled sometimes. What is your opinion of you? Because your opinion of you matters more than anything else. My opinion of you doesn't, it doesn't matter. <coughs> Excuse me. Your opinion of you matters. If you think you can do it, then you can. If you think you can't, then you cannot. If you think what you can or you can't, you're absolutely right. What matters more than anything is your opinion of you because your opinion of you will determine which voices you listen to. <laughs> That's what will happen. Your opinion of yourself. Hello? I'm not talking about the face we put on or the masks we put on for other people to think who we are. I'm talking about... When your head goes on that pillow alone at night. The real you. Not the one you portray to be. Not the one you want other people to think you are. The genuine real you. Because I tell you, I found out something in life. That no matter how good a fake is, it's still a fake. How many of us here have been hurt by fake love? in a relationship perhaps. We thought it was the real, real deal. Perhaps we're so even confused, we still do. Do not fake love those people. It smashes your heart to pieces. And then when it's in pieces, it takes a sledgehammer and then knocks a few little pieces. If you believe a lie to be the truth, it's as strong as the truth for you. 
really. It, it, it's very sad to me that people come here for this period, we've got this period, we've, you know, there's got to be a period, 180 days, to change their lives, to change their thinking, to change their beliefs, and go out and become worse than before. According to World Health Organization statistics, if there are 50 people sitting here today, one of you will succeed in recovery and get clean. And the other 49 will fail. Less than two out of that. So why, why, why do they continue with the same methodology of recovery? If there's less than 2% pass rate, what happened to you in school if you got 2%, bro? It's a fail. It's another year. You know why? Because it's a multi-billion dollar industry, that's why. Psychologists, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, the medical profession, social workers, hospitals, doctors, big pharma, that is why. They don't want to sort out the problem. So if you think your problem is going to get sorted out by following some pattern that's a failure, you're listening to the wrong voice. It grieves me. It grieves me. See a person driving head on into a collision and you say, hey, uh, hit a left, hit a right. He has a stop speed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you know that? I see some whatevers. Guys, I've come to you this morning to tell you that it's very important that you discern the voices that you listen to. No one's your manager of your life. You're the manager of your life. You may have been a good or bad manager or manager. That's not the point. What I'm trying to say is you're the one who has the final say. Whether you choose to submit, whatever you submit to is your choice. It's your choice. If you submit to drugs and they become your master, it's your choice. If you submit to a, a, a relationship that has domestic violence and you continue in it, it's your choice. If you commit to, uh, if you submit to alcohol, if you stay thirsty, no matter how much you drink, you stay thirsty. I never could understand that about alcohol. No matter how much you drink, you stay thirsty, especially the next morning. <laughs> never ending thirst. Do you know it's an anesthetic? Hello, do you know that alcohol is an anesthetic and it numbs pain? It's a painkiller. Mm. That's besides your little schoolboys who just go out and they're going to drink 10 bottles of Jagermeister and a <laughs> case of beers or whatever. That's just like an idiotic joke. But I'm talking about people who are really caught up in it. They're trying to kill some pain, they're trying to numb some pain. So I've come here and I've spoken straightforward to you guys here this morning, really, and I, I, I want to tell you, if you don't get real, you're not going to change your life. You can come here and do gym for six months, it's not going to change your life. You get big muscles. Then you probably, probably can go out and relapse and then the muscles get smaller, then you go to another place, find out which rehab's got the best gym. So try and last supplements, get your muscles big again. I know a guy has been in rehab now 27 times. Bless his two brothers. I better not mention names. <laughs> they go in there and they get all strong. They take supplements and they take suboxone. I want to say something else that's quite startling as well now. Is that the average South African doctor has not got much experience when it comes to withdrawal and hardcore medications. In other words, you don't prescribe methadone as a substitute to heroin. 
and uh, give uh, prescriptions for liters and liters of methadone. That's not, that's not what it is. Methadone is a very highly addictive substance on its own and the withdrawals are probably worse than heroin withdrawals. So what happened was, in the Second World War, they had a very powerful drug called morphine. We used to call it system morphine. Very yeah, just like it takes us to another dimension. And uh, you know, once you, uh, the people start getting hooked on morphine and then the, the withdrawals were too hectic, so they brought in heroin. And then the heroin withdrawals were a bit heavy, so they brought in a bit of the old peth. You know, pethidine and uh, now it's this other stuff and suboxone and subutex and all this, but it's all chemical heroin. You can't get off uh, poppy heroin by synthetic heroin. By creating synthetic heroin. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Do you know where a person is actually a junkie? Not in your body. All those guys we saw. You can ask. I'm not lying to you. Hundreds upon hundreds of people on the streets now, and that's where I come from. That's why I know all things are possible. Because I was one of those guys there on the beach. Hopeless. No hope, no future. But it grieves me to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And one kilometer away, there's a massive prison with all the accommodation for all those people on all the streets of Durban if they open the gates, but no one cares because that prison is next to a casino. And they don't want the dregs of society next to a casino. Otherwise, they can solve their homeless problem with no one with no answer whatsoever. You see, when money is more important than souls, than people, that is, that is called the Babylonian system, that is the world system. That is what was set up in the days of Nimrod, a guy called Nimrod in Genesis. And that is the system that talks about in Revelations. The world system is a counterfeit to the real deal, you see? But now I'm going a bit on a rabbit trail now. So I actually want to tell you people that you're going to be hearing some voices as you go out and sit under the trees there. You'll be hearing voices wherever you go, maybe off the television, maybe off your neighbor or your bunkmate or whatever the case is. But screen the stuff that's coming into your head, man. Don't just be like a robot and just be so gullible. I know people that come to rehab and, and come to the people that are on the program for counseling. They don't take counsel from the counselors. <laughs> they take counsel from under the trees. Come on now. Everybody, you must be careful what voices you listen to. But I just want to tell you that God loves you. Every one of you. He may not love what we've done, he, may, he doesn't love our mistakes, but he loves us and he's for us. And if he's for us, we can be against us. So Father, I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for giving us examples in your Bible of how powerful you are. How you used ordinary people like a shepherd boy and a murderer just to come and do something extraordinary, something great. Thank you so much, Father, for what you do in our lives, Lord. Lord, I pray that every single person who's heard this word this morning will go out and become proactive and get deliberate and do something intentional. That when we go out and we perhaps go along Durban Beach Road and we see the broken and the lost, that we can go and maybe give them a bit of hope. Just add something. Wherever they are, Father, wherever they go. And Lord, I pray for inner healing, Lord. I pray that the Lord that you give us wisdom and discernment to listen to the right voices and stop just taking everything that comes at us and believe that we have to accept it. But Father, I thank you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll water your word in the hearts of the brothers and sisters. Touch them where they need to be touched. Touch me where I need to be touched. Change us. Shape us and mold us, God. In the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Have a lovely day.